would like to thank uh, the RCC for this unique opportunity to present my work. Um, let me begin by explaining that I am concerned here with Nigerian literature in English. There are literatures both oral and written in indigenous languages in Nigeria. And there is no doubt that ecology as a subtext and as a theme is refigured in those indigenous literature. <laughs> but I'm only concerned about the one written in English. Nigerian literature in English is a colonial legacy. It is a product of colonial contacts between the West and indigenous societies that make up Nigeria today. I would like to stress this colonial foundation because it profoundly shapes the development of this literature, including how it responds to ecological issues. The paradox, uh, much stressed in postcolonial discourses, that even though this literature is a product of colonialism, it remains a powerful instrument with which the colonized can confront colonial and neo-colonial forces is crucial to an eco-critical reading of Nigerian literature. This will help us situate the literature within the scope of protest literature, a literature that, since inception, has been on the course of counter-discourse. It will also help us situate this eco-critical reading within the scope of what is known as post-colonial eco-criticism, an eco-criticism that takes into consideration the peculiarities of a post-colonial society. It is also important to point out that large-scale ecological crises in Nigeria today are mostly the immediate and long-term effects of colonialism and modernity. This is, of course, not to deny the fact that pre-colonial and indigenous societies uh, had their own ecological crisis or ecological abuse. We may recall how intertribal wars and traditional practices such as hunting might have impacted negatively on the biodiversity. But the following modern realities have engendered serious ecological crisis in Nigeria. Tin mining in Jos, which began around 14, uh, 1914, and uh, only stopped when oil was discovered. There was also coal mining in Enugu, southeastern Nigeria, which began around 1916, until oil was discovered. Ah, and then the discovery of oil by Shell BP in Oloibiri, a small town in the Niger Delta region, precisely in 1956. So perhaps the argument here is not to say these economic activities are inherently harmful, but to stress the systems put in place by the institutional powers behind these activities. That is to say, the inept manipulations, the gross neglect of the ecosystem, the tactical violence, and the incredible corruption that underline these activities. Today, as I talk to you, Nigeria, not only in the Niger Delta, is an ecological prey to local, national, and international forces that must feed the global capital with oil and minerals. Um, we have some Asians, especially people from Chinese, all over Nigeria, involved in collusion with the locals, involved in illegal mining and all kinds of things. And this have had very dire consequences on both the ecology and the people. 
Nature, the environment, and geographical locations have always remained important to the framing of Nigerian literature as a revisionist art aimed at confronting colonial discourses, and as a socially realistic art aimed at depicting the realities in Nigeria. Before the rise of environmental resistance, nature has always been, had always been a setting, a place, a location fundamental to the existential aspirations of the people, a place with which the inhabitants are organically linked. In other words, nature, the environment, has been an important organ, if you like, uh, the non-human organism without which the people do not have a life. The inhabitants of Umofia in Chinua Achebe's things fall apart, for instance, live in, make a living by, organize themselves through, and predicate their social status to nature. From nature, they get their food by farming, by hunting, by fishing. They get their medicine and medication. Their mode of worship is animist, objects of worship taken from the fauna, flora and fauna. Even in death, nature determines how a human is viewed. If his or her body is thrown into the evil forest, it means he or she has died a bad, I mean, has died in a bad way. So the evil forest, uh, ironically framed, remains a crucial organ, uh, the other being against which the people frame their legacy. Although Neo Oshundari's The Eye of the Earth, published in 1986, anticipates environmentalism of the poor, and by which I mean the capitalist subjugation of the environment and its helpless inhabitants, early Nigerian literature emphasized the transformative powers of nature, uh, nature's possibilities to transform human lives and people's longing to fully understand themselves as individuals, as communities, by unraveling their sometimes mysterious connections uh, to nature. Environmentalism of the poor in Nigerian literature today can be historically pinned to the judicial killing of Kensaro Wiwa, the writer and environmental activist from the Ogoni ethnic nationality in the Niger Delta region. At the height of his environmental activism, when he became a threat to multinational oil corporations, especially Shell BP, he was arrested by the regime of General Sani Abacha, tried in a military tribunal, and hanged by, I mean, in November 1995. His death was widely condemned around the world, and having established, by the way, he was a well-known writer before going into um, environmental activism. So the literati in Nigeria looked upon his death as a very a serious affront to them and to humanity in general. In reaction to the killing of Kensaro Wiwa, there emerged in the 1990s an efflorescence of creative writing, especially the poetry genre, first as a tribute to the environmental activists, then as a discourse of protest against despotism and petrodollar capitalism. This coincided with the time that there was an upsurge of pressures on the military regime in Nigeria to conduct elections and return the nation to a democratic uh, dispensation. Nigerian literature depicting ecological crisis is therefore marked by a strong tone of resistance in the mode of protest aesthetics traditional to African literature. Um, and these are some of the works. Um, they range from fiction, non-fiction, poetry, and drama. The aesthetic form of this echo writing, I mean, most of them, is largely hinged on what I would like to call militant metaphors that imagine an oppressor bent on destroying the environment and its inhabitants, who must therefore be destroyed. The themes 
mainly include air, water, oil, I mean soil pollution in the Niger Delta region, the erosion in the southeastern region of Nigeria, desertification and mining in northern Nigeria, as well as industrialization and urban pollution. To read this echo writing, to read this literature, we need to take into consideration its peculiarities as a resistant discourse in a post-colonial society. We need, for instance, to understand that in their figuration of the anti-environment oppressor, they historicize the collusion between the Nigerian government and the international extractive industry. Uh, there is almost always a neo-colonial project in the institutions of power that cause ecological damage in Nigeria. They understand that the oil corporation in the Niger Delta, reluctant to clean up their mess, are owned by the powerful West. They know the politics informing the reluctance of Shell BP to clean up their prolonged over 50 years of oil spills in Nigeria as against their immediate and massive response to the Deep Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Post-colonialism, as a form of revisionist and polit politically engaged discourse, needs to be recognized as part of any eco-critical context for reading Nigerian eco-writing. And as we all know, eco-criticism itself can also, I mean, is, is a revisionist and politically engaged discourse, so it is not at all difficult to see the connection between the two modes of reading, and which uh, scholars like um, um, uh, Graham and uh, Tiffin had, had drawn in their seminal book, Postcolonial Ecocriticism, Literature, Animals, and the Environment, and uh, have listed other uh, scholars who have drawn the connection between postcolonialism and ecocriticism. Uh, the following meeting points have been drawn between the two. Both discourses come from below to entangle themselves in power relations with powerful hierarchical discourses. They come from what you may call the subaltern position and have continued to face institutional skepticism. Two, both discourses are hopefully resistant in nature in order to cater for the fate of the hitherto suppressed beings, largely human in the case of post-colonialism and largely non-human in the case of eco-criticism. Three, both push for change and transformation. In other words, they advocate for socio-environmental change for the condition of human and non-human beings. Um, and lastly, there are discourses that demand the writer as well as the reader to take a political stance. Uh, they emphasize empathic reading, uh, empathic reading. And my emphasis on reading here is deliberate. I mean, the term reading is to show that here we are dealing with literature, which is different from um, I mean, the, the text we have here is a literary text, it's not a historical text, it's not an anthropological text, which implies that there is a conscious use of literary devices, and it is when we are fully able to deconstruct these devices that we see some of the uh, political forces that I am talking about. A further theoretical strand to my eco-critical reading of Nigerian literature is the new historicist dimension. I deploy the ideas of new historicism, also known as, well as cultural materialism, to foreground the organic relation between this eco-writing and the realities they historicize. How the literature is not only fed by the ecological realities, but feeds our understanding of the ecological realities by seeking to radicalize our opinions uh, of these realities. I find quite useful Stephen Greenblatt's idea of cultural poetics, in which he conceives an art culture, such as the culture of eco writing in Nigeria, as containing, in quote, constraint and mobility. A culture embodies two paradoxical processes of constraint and mobility. 
on the one hand, the culture's inherent capabilities to control, constrain, and limit the actions and utterances of subjects within it. On the other hand, the culture's tendency to be susceptible to the desires of the subjects within it to seek way of expansion, ways of transcending the culture's limitations. So there are two seemingly opposing uh, processes, constraint and mobility. So within the culture, the culture wants to hold you down, but you also want to move, and the culture also provides that opportunity for you to move. According to Grimblatt, creative writers whom he calls marvelous improvisers because of their ability to improvise realities with imaginative language are inclined to create the condition of mobility within a culture. They use their artistic work to deliberately truncate the status quo, directing people's consciousness towards the possibilities of transformation. My contention here, therefore, is that Nigerian contemporary echo writing does not merely reflect the ecological damage going on, but marvelously recreates it to trigger a change in the way we understand the damage by provoking our consciousness towards socio-environmental transformation. The writers see themselves as a collective of improvisers focused on subversive aesthetics. Poems, plays, fictional and non-fictional narratives concerned with environmentalism should be therefore understood, interpreted, appraised when they are placed within the dynamic cultural condition that produces them, when their subversive intents are fully shaped. Um, so uh, let me briefly, I have a few minutes left, let me briefly do a reading of, of, of one poem, I mean, in, in line with my argument here. And I am reading a poem called, We Thought It Was Oil But It Was Blood, by Nemo Basse. Basse's poem is evocative. It vividly captures the condition of the people and their earth in a simple tonal insistence and a rhythmic pattern realized in the refrain. We thought it was oil, but it was blood. This is a, a refrain that runs through the poem. The poet identifies himself also as a victim, stretching the meaning of we to encapsulate not just humans, but also the earth, which hurt as well. Indeed, bleeds from the anti-human and anti-ecological activities of an implied oppressor figure. The poem begins from a happy past, uh, when things were good, and moves to hopelessness and uh, a total police state. The poem recalls the time people danced in the street, had joy in their hearts, and thought they had freedom, especially one that came with the discovery of oil in the land. But it is quick to contrast that image to the reality of death in a way that even just the reader. The reader is suddenly told of the three young folks and the countless more who collapse under the fires of the red hot guns. In a single stanza, the poem transports us from its idyllic past to a horrendous presence. The telling contrast between the street dance and the rains of guns continue to dominate the poem. Although the poem shies away from overtly depicting the oppressor, the structure of, his, of the poet's trinity and his metonymic construction, such as guns, the shells, notice capital S in the shells, military shields, point up the image of soldier oppressor. The context is unmistakable, the disturbing presence of the military in the Niger Delta. The poem implicitly refers to shell corporation when it says, we see their shells behind military shields, evil, horrible, gallows called oil rigs drilling our souls. This is the poem's way of capturing the connivance between the regime and the oil companies in oppressing the rural people. The strength of this poem is in the strong images of abandonment, hardship, oppression, frustration, displacement, and so on. 
Uh, and uh, as, as you can see from the second um, uh, quote, with the accent on rise, you know, the personal optimism, in spite of all this uh, problem, personal optimism is, is seen in the second uh, quote when we say, they may kill all, but the blood will speak. They may gain all, but the soil will rise. We may die, and yet that and yet stay alive. With the accent on rise, the poem dramatizes the hope of a people who will not give up no matter the degree of activities of the viperous uh, institutions. The image of blood here is, is uh, double-natured. The blood of the earth as it is being injured, as well as the blood of the humans that are slain. In conclusion, I would like to point out from my reading of eco literature in Nigeria that it is overwhelmingly inclined to the environmentalism of the poor. It imagines the environment as a traditional home of helpless locals, brutally disconnected and displaced from their earth. It is less concerned about global debates on climate change, excessive consumption, or post-human science. It is rather concerned about concrete conditions of precarity and systematic annihilation arising from capitalist invasions of powerless local communities in search of oil and minerals. And yet, it is a literature that envisages liberation that comes after persistent struggle. And I have therefore described the production of this literature as an act of literary militancy. Thank you for your time.